Very good. Here we go. Okay, okay. one. Uh, okay, brief introduction. As I said at the beginning, go to lasertalks.com if you want the longer bio. Laura Marx teaches in the School for the Contemporary Arts at Simon Fraser University of Vancouver. She works on media art and philosophy and is the author of four books. Uh, and she's working on a new book. Um, tentative title is Intriguing, Unfolding, Unfolding Aesthetics. She's the founder, co-founder of several several things let me just mention co-founder of the substantial motion research network and uh, she founded the small file media festival okay audience is yours all right thank you i'm um, really delighted to be here and i'm uh, uh, happy that my talk follows up really really nicely after sam's and rachel's and I see some friends out there. Hi, uh, Pat and Kat and Zaki. Uh, okay, so I'm going to begin with um, some statistics. Uh, the data centers, networks, and devices that comprise ICT, information and communication technologies, uh, now are calculated to consume as much of, as 7% of global electricity and are variously calculated to emit as much as 4% of global greenhouse gases, which is more than the airline industry. And uh, unchecked, the carbon emissions resulting from ICT could exceed 14% of the 2016 level worldwide by 2040. Streaming media contributes more than any other sector to this increase which is now being accelerated by um, blockchain. And my team uh, tackling the carbon footprint of steam streaming media, which is a group of uh, media scholars and ICT engineers spent a year surveying that research. Um, here's the diagram of, um, that explains the uh, disavowal of um, streaming media's uh, uh, carbon footprint. It's easy not, easy not to think about it when uh, the image is uh, received in a site separate from the infrastructure that produces it, which includes, or the, um, uh, which includes uh, data centers and networks, and even further separate from the site where our devices are produced. You see that's across a body of water, mostly in China and where the metals that go into their production are mined. Um, so in 2020, I founded the Small File Media Festival to draw attention to the carbon footprint of streaming media and of ICT overall. And at the Small File Media Festival, we invite artists to submit movies of no larger than five megabytes in size and five minutes in length. And uh, at the end, I'm going to show you a clip from one of these um, little jewels. Uh, now, I'm going to stop sharing and talk for a while about soul assemblages. So this is a taste of process philosophy that conceives of the universe as both interconnected and ever-changing, a transforming continuity. And some of the thinkers who inspire me are uh, Sadr al-Din al-Shirazi with the concept of the flow of being, uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz with the monadology, uh, Gilles Deleuze's University of Being, and uh, Edouard Glissant's philosophy of relation. So I'm going to talk about uh, ensouled matter or boundedness, and this follows really well on Sam's talk. So first I'm going to argue that almost everything has a soul. So first I ask, what is the cosmos made of? And it's made of us, us living beings. And what is alive, for starters, it's anything that feels, acts, or communicates. And to do so, it has to have some kind of internal consistency, some provisional boundedness, a skin. 
A living being is a temporary fold in the cosmos that brings together a point of view. And such a being can be a person, a molecule, a computer chip, a movie, a planet. As Leibniz described it, a monad is a single soul that innately includes the entire universe, the way that the inf infinitesimal implies the infinite by being uh, a ratio that includes the infinite, um, basically uh, one divided by infinity. So each monad, Leibniz wrote, expresses, however confusedly, everything that happens in the universe, whether past, present, or future. So in the common division between the organic and the inorganic, life is thought to be an attribute of organs. And in uh, the biosemiotics of Jesper Hofmeier, what is alive is defined as something that is bounded by a membrane, which makes it capable to make and interpret signs. As for example, a cell interprets and responds to the electrochemical information that passes through its cell walls. So having some kind of skin or boundary seems to define what is alive. Leibniz, enjoying the new technology of microscopy, perceived the universe as packed tight with nested souls. And this is exactly what Sam was referring to. He wrote, each portion of matter may be conceived like a garden full of plants and like a pond full of fishes. But each branch of every plant each member of every animal, each drop of it, its liquid parts, is also some such garden or pond. So what this means is that ensouled matter is everywhere and that souls are always recombining into larger and more fleeting souls. In Leibniz's folded dualism, matter consists of bodies and is packed with spirits. He wrote that the veins in marble constitute the souls of creatures that are fossilized there. So we can think then that oil is the liquid body of the fossilized souls of animals and plants from millions of years ago. Although I actually uh, switch out Leibniz for Deleuze, who says, if life has a soul, it, it is because it perceives distinguishes or discriminates. So this really broadens up our understanding of what a soul can be. And further, the soul of a thing consists partly in what it can do, and that's Spinoza. So I propose that the boundedness or skin of uh, all different kinds of entities, including ones that seem inorganic, like rocks or cities, lies and the processes that bind them together internally for some period of time. So uh, for human processes, such as a crowd or a movie or a city, um, they are bound together uh, and they have, for this reason, they have a soul. Uh, some of them are also assemblages, defined as a group of disparate entities held together by what it does a process held together by its action. And furthermore, I think that even things that don't do anything still have experience. The way a little chip of stone packed side by side with other stones you know, in, in the pavement experiences their pressure upon it, the passage of air and water, changes in temperature, and it registers these and changes to itself. So in that way, something like that little chip of stone is passionate. And passion, which is uh, having a feeling while being unable to act, is a soulful way to be. So defining ensouled matter as a process or an assemblage allows us to overcome the prejudice against human-made things as lacking life. And I'm also, re also remembering the useful definition from Bruno Latour of a thing as a gathering of interests. So in these ways, a city has a soul, a movie has a soul, uh, even the freedom convoy that is still uh, dogging our life here in Canada has a soul. Since the soul of a thing is what it can do, 
Ideas have souls. Words and phrases have souls that are born anew every time they are uttered. And works of art have souls because they do things. The assemblage of disparate souls produces a provisional collective skin that you can imagine as the surface boundary of a murmuration of starlings expanding, involuting, uh, transforming. And that membrane has a very special tensile strength. Deleuze and Gattari uh, call the shifting boundary of a multiplicity a fiber uh, stretching in from humans and animals to molecules, particles, and imperceptible things, and out to the universe. And they write, every fiber is a universe fiber. A fiber strung across borderlines constitutes a line of flight or of deterritorialization. So you can imagine this pliable, responsive, collective skin stretching from the center of each ent entity within a soul assemblage um, into the infinitesimal and out to the cosmos. Okay, monads possess, enclose, and dominate other monads too. Uh, other monads which they need to survive. So I enclose my organs, a factory encloses workers, a silicon chip encloses electrons. And once we think about it that way, the knowledge that one's life is predicated on or populated by other lives makes it hard to say, I have a body, I have a plantation, or even I have an idea. I mentioned the plantation because um, uh, Leibniz's concept of the monad and the idea of dominated monads um, uh, or enclosed monads occurred historically at the time when uh, European countries were beginning to uh, um, colonize other, other countries and um, justify the slave trade as a way of uh, producing um, new kinds of value through agriculture. Uh, yeah, so uh, ha being composed of all these uh, internal monads that are really other beings, other souls, means that everything that makes us what we are, everything that we have, in fact, comes from outside of us and is only temporarily closed within our membrane. So an ethical question for any situation can be, how are the souls folded together here? And what does the situation afford all the souls that are assembled in this soul assemblage? Okay, now I'm going to talk about soul assemblage media. And I'm going to suggest that all media works are soul assemblages. I use the uh, I'm inspired by Jetil Roja, um, who analyzes movies as assemblages that bind together the material support, the filmmakers, the script, uh, the mediums of transmission and projection, the audiences, and the affects that flow among them, which are different with every iteration. And each of those entities, of course, has a soul. I also want to mention that uh, media works are cosmic because they co-modulate with um, cosmic flows of light waves and sound waves, analog and digital flows. Um, digital media use uh, millions of electron souls that are corralled and cajoled into circuits, but always have the possibility of escape. Um, the film medium uses uh, cosmic media such as uh, uh, metals and plants. Media devices also use the souls of iron and copper. And uh, digital media connect to the increasingly rare metals that are needed to support semiconductor miniaturization, which, as we know, are extracted at a very high cost to the Earth and in the Democratic Republic of Congo of humanitarian atrocities. I shouldn't smile when I say atrocities. And this is all because of tantalum, which is twice as dense as steel, uh, durable, 
highly ductile and especially easy to weld. So tantalum is valued for its ability to smooth the flow of electrons in miniaturized circuits. And it's fascinating to study that uh, uh, the greater demand there is for miniaturization, the more demand there is for um, ever more uh, 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 creative um, kinds of uh, rare metals. Usually these metals die with the device's obsolescence in, uh, in dumps in poor countries. They can easily be recycled, but uh, are not very often. Uh, but the same can't be said of the sad polymers, the fossil souls that include enclose uh, cameras and laptops and mobile devices. They're pretty much uh, unrecyclable. So unfortunately, a lot of moving image media is toxic to the planet, um, as well as massive amounts of waste. There are chemicals from film processing and now the unsustainable carbon footprint of streaming media. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, two kinds of media assemblages, um, uh, both um, which have the possibility to be very small works with very big connections. And first I'm gonna talk about NFT art. And so apologies to Rachel for taking a very, an admittedly very one-sided take on the medium of your sophisticated work, which encloses a lot of souls of um, many artistic practices and mediums and their history. But the problem is that um, NFT renders digital artworks unique, but at an intolerable cost to the planet, because that uniqueness, as I'm sure you all know, relies on the energy intensive blockchain, which uses the calculation heavy proof, proof of work algorithm. So NFT art encloses many souls. And first and foremost, those are the coal, the souls of coal and other fossil fuels that power the majority of data centers. Um, and we can talk about um, how much energy is used by uh, different uh, components of ICT and about claims by some data center, op center operators that they are 100% renewable at source. Uh, second, they're the souls of the data centers that crunch the proof of work algorithm and more lightly of the networks that support all of those transactions and the devices on which NFT art is displayed. And I want to mention that um, our devices about is calculated that about 85% of their lifetime electricity use occurs in production. So that means that we should try to keep our devices as long as possible because they have a very big carbon footprint too. Uh, and then there are the souls of rare metals. And uh, last but not least, the souls of uh, artists, uh, many of whom start working in NFT because they're anxious to make, about making a living, and the souls of investors. However, <laughs> uh, there are other kinds of digital artworks that fold together human and cosmic forces in ways that have a lighter footprint in the cosmos. So I'm going to show you part of one of the movies from the Small File Media Festival. And this is by the uh, Canadian artist, um, Christopher Carruth, and it's called Why Wonder. So first I'm gonna start it and then I'm gonna share it. It's not that easy being green. Have I spent each day in the color of leaves? When I think it would be nicer being red or yellow or gold or something much more colorful like that. It's not that easy being green. 
it seems you blend in with so many other, other ordinary, ordinary things. things. And, and people, people tend, tend to pass you over. Because you're, you're not standing, standing out like a spark bark in the water, water or stars, or stars in, in the sky. sky. But, but green, but green, green coloring ring. And green, and green can be and green, and green could be, could be big, big like an ocean, like an ocean or, imp or important like a, like a mountain or tall like, like, a, like tree. a tree okay <laughs> so uh, Christopher Karras Why Wonder uh, forms a soul assemblage with things that include um, green felt, uh, Kermit the Frog, the wistful singing voice of the late Jim, Jim Henson, a YouTube page, over 9 million unique, well, well viewers, uh, the material infrastructure of um, ICT across which the video has traveled, a compression algorithm necessary to get this video down to less than five megabytes, and the JavaScript errors that Karras uses to jitter the image. Unlike the majority of digital media that dis disavows its material support, this little movie acknowledges the irony, this, this longing, uh, the longing to be green, is fed by fossil fuel burning ICT infrastructure. Uh, oh, and I do want to mention, by the way, that um, uh, my criticisms of NFT art would uh, be much less um, uh, at the point when the calculation-heavy proof of, proof of work algorithm gives way to the much lighter proof of stake algorithm, but it, I'm not seeing signs of that happening anytime very soon. Digital media that use appropriate technologies with a light footprint, like small file movies, are salubrious soul assemblages that collaborate with electrons, uh, allow the electrons to assert their freedom in the demagnetization and digital glitch. They acknowledge the ICT infrastructure but demand little of it. And in this way, they, they're able to show how they reach into the infinitesimal and out to the cosmos and uh, reflect the cosmos in a way that makers, audiences, the infrastructure, and the media themselves can feel good about being part of this soul assemblage. Okay, thank you. That's it. Very interesting, a very, a very original take. I, I've never heard the talk that was bridging philosophy, environmentalism, and, and art. Um, let's start with the philosophy. Uh, I'm curious how what you were discussing about uh, soul process and so on, how does that fit with uh, a, a, a philosophy that I'm familiar with, uh, pan, uh, panpsychism? Um, mm -hmm. You're probably familiar with uh, Alfred North Whitehead, yeah. all the way, I think, to David Chalmers. There's been several philosophers who think the mind is... Uh, is, is ubiquitous in the universe. Mm -hmm. How does that fit with, with your view of, um, mm -hmm. of the soul the universe? Yeah, and I would also mention that um, panpsychism is a, a very universal philosophy. There's a lot of world religions and uh, indigenous worldviews that, uh, that share uh, something like panpsychism. But actually what I'm saying is a little bit lighter than panpsychism, because that's usually defined as uh, saying that all entities are conscious. And uh, I'm not saying all entities are conscious. I have this very minimal definition of, of a soul as something that acts or something that feels um, or something that um, uh, responds. So I'm not attributing consciousness or an ability to think to all of those entities I'm talking about, though some of them do have it. Excellent. Okay. Um, 
being marginally involved in the world of blockchain, I can say that a lot of us are working and trying to make it more energy efficient. So hopefully there will be progress there very soon. Okay. Hope well, so too. Yeah, thank you, Laura. It's too bad that the internet connection is bad, so we cannot continue the conversation. Uh, but thank you very much. Very, very interesting presentation. Um, very unique uh, point of view. Thank you.